pull out your Bibles. Uh, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 61. Um, I want to start by talking about uh, what my family does a little bit. My, my kids and I really enjoy reading together several times per week. Uh, before reading a couple chapters of the Bible, we'll also read uh, a chapter from whatever book we're reading uh, together at the time. Uh, this week, we finished reading two books together. We finished reading uh, the book of Deuteronomy, and uh, we also uh, finished reading... Um, well, actually, we haven't finished it yet, but we will finish by the time this sermon uh, finishes. Uh, by the time this sermon, how do I say that? <laughs> by the time you see this sermon, we will also have finished the seventh book in the series, uh, A Series of Unfortunate Events. Um, I'd like to read a portion of that book to you right now uh, on pages 21 and 22 of uh, The Hostile Hospital. It says this, of all the ridiculous expressions people use, and people use a great many ridiculous expressions. One of the most ridiculous is, no news is good news. No news is good news simply means that if you don't hear from someone, everything is probably fine. Um, you can see at once why this expression makes little sense, because everything being fine is only one of many, many reasons why someone may not contact you. Perhaps they are tied up. Maybe they are surrounded by fierce weasels, or perhaps they are wedged tightly between two refrigerators and cannot get themselves out. The expression might well be changed to, no news is bad news, except that people may not be able to contact you because they have just been crowned king or are competing in a gymnastics tournament. The point is that there is no way to know why someone has not contacted you until they contact you and explain themselves. For this reason, the sensible expression would be, no news is no news except that it is so obvious that it is hardly an expression at all. Uh, I love that. <laughs> it just makes sense, right? And yet, we've probably all at some point used the expression, no news is good news. Uh, and I think the reason uh, we've all used this expression is because we've all grown so accustomed to bad news being the norm that we'd much rather have no news at all. Maybe in today's cultural climate that makes sense. Um, but I hope that we can all agree that Good news is far better than no news. Um, for the next few weeks, as we approach Christmas, we're going to be talking about a few aspects of the gospel, which literally translated is good news. To start, we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 4, which talks about someone who was anointed to bring the good news. Please turn there with me. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 4. It says this, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. And they may, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Let's pray together. Uh, Father, I, I pray that you would uh, do that in us, uh, that you would speak through us this morning, and that the good news would be clear to us all, that we might all rest in Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, what's the best thing that you can imagine happening in the next few months? Uh, maybe you can imagine getting another stimulus check. Uh, maybe you can imagine celebrating Christmas with all of your family with no limitations whatsoever, not even implied limitations. Uh, maybe you can imagine uh, the person that you voted for in the last election actually becoming president of the United States. Maybe. Maybe not. But what if you could dream even bigger? Um, what if you could dream about poverty and disease being eradicated from the world? What if you could dream about all the people in the whole world being treated with um, fairness and, and dignity and respect since everyone has been made in the image of God? What if we could all rejoice together in the grace of God? What's the best news that you can think of? Now, imagine that it was your job to share that news, to tell everyone in the whole world that awesome news. Would you be excited? 
or maybe a, a little humbled, maybe scared. I'd probably be all of those things, um, even a lot scared, uh, because I'd be worried that people wouldn't believe me uh, and, and that they would actually try to argue against me against the good news. Our scripture this morning talks about someone who was anointed by God to bring good news. When the prophet Isaiah originally wrote these words, he was talking about himself. Uh, God had anointed Isaiah to proclaim the good news of liberty uh, to the Jews who were in exile. That was his job. His job was to preach good news. I mean, who wouldn't want that job? Well, apparently, Isaiah didn't. Um, when he was first appointed, Isaiah said this in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Isaiah didn't feel very worthy. He didn't feel worthy to preach good news, at least not until he was made worthy. Uh, verse 6 says this, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had uh, taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. So even though Isaiah didn't feel worthy to preach the good news, he was made worthy. And then he preached the good news with joy. The truth is, none of us are worthy. None of us are worthy in and of ourselves to talk about God. We've, we've all sinned. None of us are worthy to talk about God, to speak his name, or even be in his presence. The truth is, None of us are worthy. And the Old Testament describes how in the Jewish temple, there, there was a curtain that separated the, the holy place from the most holy place, where God was said to dwell. Nobody was ever allowed to go into the most holy place, even if they might want to, not, not even to take a peek, because nobody was worthy of entering into God's presence because of their sin. Uh, but just once a year, the high priest was appointed by God to go into the most holy place uh, behind the curtain to make atonement for the people's sins, offering the blood of animals. But then, hundreds of years later, Jesus died on the cross. And at that very moment, that curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place was torn in two, from the top to the bottom. God tore it in two. Because when Jesus paid the price for sin, it was once for all. And God is no longer separate from his people. You see, we're not worthy to be in God's presence because of our sin. And yet, we're made worthy by the blood of Jesus. So the next time you feel unworthy, remember what Jesus did for you. The Bible calls you a child of God. For that is what you are, the Bible says. Jesus has separated your sin from you as far as the east is from the west, and there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So rise up, church. Rise up to walk a new life in Christ. Like Isaiah did, don't just believe the good news, but base your life on the good news and share the good news with all the world. But ultimately, this morning, uh, our passage in Isaiah chapter 60, 61 doesn't just refer to Isaiah or to us, but to Jesus. Um, you might remember that Jesus even read the first part of Isaiah 61 in a, in a synagogue and, and told all of them that it was talking about himself. Uh, check it out. Uh, Luke chapter 4, verse, uh, starting in verse 26, it says, And he, talking about Jesus, came to Nazareth, uh, where, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, uh, to, set all, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. You see, more than Isaiah, who was appointed to 
proclaim good news to the people of Israel, and, and, and more than the high priest who was to offer a sacrifice every year behind the curtain, and more than any preacher today who claims God's anointing, Jesus is the anointed one of God. So let's look and see what Jesus came to do. In Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, it says that he came to bring good news to the poor. Now we could understand that literally, saying that the financially poor won't be financially poor in heaven because they'll inherit the riches of heaven, and, and that's true. Or we could understand it spiritually because of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in that line of thought, we, we, we would say that it's important that we, we recognize that we're all spiritually bankrupt. And, and we're all only saved by grace through faith in Jesus' death for us on the cross. But, but either way, whether you're literally poor or spiritually poor, Jesus proclaims good news to you. And also in verse 1, it says that he came to bind up the brokenhearted. He came to heal our hearts. Have you ever had a heavy heart? Have you ever been brokenhearted? Jesus came to heal you. And at the end of verse 1, it says that Jesus came to proclaim liberty to the captives and, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. The truth is, we've all been captive to our sin. But Jesus sets us free. And this is a point that I think a lot of unbelievers and even unbelievers don't quite understand. Uh, when a lot of people look at the Bible, they see a book of rules. And they feel confined by those rules. Um, they, they see those rules as limiting our freedom, limiting our joy. And the Bible certainly does contain a lot of rules. And often people today scoff at those rules and say, man, they're just outdated. But here's the thing. Understood rightly and, and in context, the Bible's rules don't limit our freedom, but show us how we might enjoy true freedom in God's kingdom. It's like water for a fish. Um, water actually allows fish to live and thrive. If a fish one day was intrigued by seeing a boat and, and decided to live on the boat instead of in the water, that fish would die. It's not built for the boat. It, it can't breathe the air in, 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 uh, in, in outside of the ocean. It, um, it would die. The Bible is like that for us. It's not meant to restrict our freedom or joy. It's actually to show us what true freedom and joy looks like. True freedom and joy comes through resting and rejoicing in Jesus. I think that's why in verse 2 it says that God's anointed one came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, this is interesting, I think. When Jesus quoted this passage in the synagogue, he, he left off that last part about vengeance. Um, he read about the year of favor, but not about the day of vengeance. And most commentaries suggest that this is because Jesus' first coming had to do with the Lord's favor. He came to die for our sin. And then his second coming will have to do with God's vengeance as he destroys all of his enemies. And I think there's something to that. But, but I think by not quoting the part about God's vengeance, Jesus was actually bringing even more attention to that part. Uh, because the Jews who he was talking to at the time, they were familiar with the scripture. And Jesus was, in essence, saying, be ready, because it's coming soon. And at the end of his life, after preaching good news to the poor and to the brokenhearted, and to the captives, all, all of whom were spiritually bankrupt, Jesus allowed himself to be nailed to the cross for their sins, taking on himself the Lord's vengeance. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, it displayed both God's mercy and wrath, his judgment towards sin and favor towards sinners. And in doing that, as it says at the end of verse 2, Jesus came to comfort all who mourn. 
Have you ever mourned? I mean, once again, we could look at this at two different ways. So I think we've all mourned the loss of loved ones. We, we've mourned because of our circumstances that we've had to grow, go through in life. But, but spiritually, have you ever mourned for the state of your own soul? For the spiritual state of our world? Have you ever been so broken over your sin and of the sins of the world that you just felt like entering into a deep depression? The good news is that by grace, through faith in Jesus, our hearts will be healed. The good news is that we will be freed. And check out what happens to us when when that happens. Look at verses 3 and 4. It says, To grant to those who mourn in Zion to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. See, this is talking about the effect that Jesus ought to have on our lives. When your heart is healed, and when you're freed from sin, you'll be changed. You'll be changed from a life of mourning to one of gladness. You'll change from having a faint, depressed spirit to having a spirit of praise to God. And it says that just as Jesus came to proclaim the good news to us, we'll also become people who build up the ancient ruins. We'll we'll see other people in their needs and seek to meet their needs. We'll become people who proclaim the good news to our neighbors who desperately need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. See, church family, we're given the good news not to hoard it for ourselves, but to tell it to all the world. No news is not good news. The good news is good news. And it's for all the earth. Have you trusted in the good news? Have you trusted in Jesus? It's really hard for us to preach good news unless we really see it as good news. Do you see first the bad news of your sin and then how Jesus came to rescue you from your sin? That's the good news. Um, Don't let it go in one ear and out the other. Trust in Jesus this morning and base your life on the gospel. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for Jesus. Help us to um, believe. Help us to rest in what Jesus has done for us. And and truly believing, help us to proclaim the good news wherever we go. Um, Letting everyone know how good Jesus is. That he came to save them from their sins, that they might have hope. um, That they might be healed. That they might be free. Help us proclaim to all the world the gospel. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.